Thanks for joining us, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Love Your Columbia webinar on microplastics in the Columbia River. My name is Lori Epstein, and I'm the Water Quality Director with Columbia Riverkeeper. And we're really excited you're here with us today. Um, before we get started, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, we at Columbia Riverkeeper recognize the unique and enduring relationships that exist between Native people and their traditional territories. And we respectfully acknowledge the places that we're joining today's webinar from rest on the traditional lands of Native people who have cared for these lands and waters since time immemorial and continue to do so today. I'm joining you from Hood River, Oregon, which rests on the tr traditional lands of the Wasco Wishram, Warm Springs, and Yakima Nation. And I definitely encourage you to learn more about the Columbia Plateau tribes. You can check out the Tribal Nations websites or the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Con Commission website. Um, and I also would like to thank um, the Environmental Protection Agency today. Um, this webinar is part of Columbia Riverkeepers Columbia Gorge Pollution Prevention Education and Outreach Project, which is funded by the EPA's Columbia River Basin Restoration Funding Assistance Program. It's a grants program for environmental protection and restoration programs throughout the Columbia River Basin um, that provides a framework for funding for toxics reduction, monitoring, and outreach actions. So thanks to the EPA for um, making today's event possible. And I should also say that um, while this webinar has been funded by the United States Environmental Protection Agency under the um, assistance agreement with Columbia Riverkeeper, the contents of this webinar do not necessarily reflect the views and policies of the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, a couple other housekeeping items. Um, we are, um, we'll be leaving some time for questions at the end of um, the webinar. So please just put those questions in the chat. You can put them in at at any time during the, the webinar, um, but we'll, we'll go through those at the end and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, and right now I'd love for everybody to um, go ahead and open up the chat and if you um, would be willing to, to type in where you're logging in from and what the weather's like there. I'm here in Hood River and it's dumping snow outside the window, which is really exciting. So we'd love to hear um, where folks are coming in from. And, um, one other thank you is to um, Coraball. They're the makers of the microfiber catching laundry ball. And microfibers are the most common type of microplastics found in the Columbia. And they're shed from synthetic clothing like polyester and nylon and fleece. Um, and you all received a discount code. And then at the end of the webinar, we will also announce a lucky winner um, who will receive a free Coraball. So definitely stay, stay tuned for that. And I should also mention that the coupon code is good until December 31st, but if you were thinking about holiday gifts, the deadline for holiday shipping is tomorrow. So um, you might wanna get on that if you're interested in that. Um, so now I'd like to introduce um, today's speaker. And um, today we have um, Kirsten Kapp. She is a researcher and professor of biological sciences at Central Wyoming College. We might all be familiar with images of plastic waste piled on beaches and bird carcasses full of undigested plastic, but her research focuses on microplastic pollution in freshwater ecosystems and includes a study on microplastic hotspots on the Snake and Columbia rivers. It's really exciting to have her here today and her work is so important for the Columbia River. Much of the research that's happened on plastics has been on the marine environment. And while research on freshwater ecosystems um, has been increasing, it's still limited. So it's really cool to have such smart science and important research happening right here um, on the Columbia River. And we're just really lucky to have her in our watershed. So Kirsten, um, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with all of us today, and I will turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lori. Let me go ahead and share my screen with everybody. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here and I thank all of you for taking the time during uh, your lunch hour to attend and learn more from me um, about microplastics and uh, the Columbia River and my research. So um, 
first of all, I'd like to start off by letting you all take a mental vacation. Um, don't get too excited, it's not gonna last long. I'm going to show you a number of different images of locations and I want you to be yourself into that location, look around and think about what each location that I put you in has in common. And then you, at the end, you can go ahead and write in the chat things that come to mind after I show you those um, different locations. So we'll start ahead with the first one here. And then here they all are together on one slide. So if you can go ahead and chat and write down the first thing that comes to mind when you kind of imaginarily put yourself in each location or what these all have in common. Space, quiet, water, remote, pristine, excellent. So while all of these places do look very pristine, I like to start my talk out because you don't see much interference with humans in every one of these locations. But in every single one of these places, scientists have collected environmental samples and found them to be contaminated with microplastics. And when I first began my research back in 2014, I just focused on the ocean. I thought that at the time, microplastics and marine debris was really just an ocean problem. And I'm having a hard time advancing my screen. There we go. Okay. And so microplastics at first were considered just to be an ocean problem. And this is a picture here of the Pacific gyre, um, which we've heard again now in the news recently of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch um, providing habitat for certain organisms. And while you're in the Pacific gyre, you might definitely see large accumulations of marine debris like you do on the lower right here. A majority of what we're finding are these confetti-like pieces of microplastics on the lower left. And that is what I study, are these tiny bits of microplastics. So in order to continue on and to learn more about this, we first have to talk about what microplastics are. So microplastics, as many of you may have heard about, um, are small plastic particles that really are classified as something smaller than five millimeters in size. So that's like smaller than a grain of rice or the top of a pencil with a pencil eraser. And microplastics come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. So in this image, you can see the variability in these microplastics and the size. So these are all placed on top of a ruler and each kind of um, space between the bars there is equivalent to one millimeter. And so the different shapes we actually categorize as different types of microplastics. So for example, we categorize them as fragments. So those are irregular shaped particles, maybe with some sharp edge edges, as you can see um, the arrows here pointing to some examples of your fragments. We also classify them as beads or granules or spheres. So these can be smooth surfaced uh, plastic particles or um, uh, polystyrene foam spheres are even more globular as well. A third classification then are films. So think like your plastic bag that's very thin and very flexible. Okay, that's another type of microplastics that we find in the environment. And then finally, the microfibers. And so microfibers can um, be larger like fishing line or parts of um, disregarded fishing nets from the fishing industry, or can be thinner and smaller like those microfibers that are shed from your clothing that Lori mentioned in her introduction. So they come in all different shapes and sizes. Now, where do they come from? So that's the important question, right? So we've been able to identify a number of different sources of microplastics um, that then are emitted into the environment. So one such source are the wastewater treatment facilities. And I'm sure you've all heard about this. It's been in the news headlines for quite some time now. And what um, wastewater treatment effluent and the microplastics that enter the environment are in this way are primarily bits of plastic that we wash down our drains. So for example, many 
Personal hygiene products contain microplastic beads. Um, that's now kind of being phased out as we've realized that that's actually a problem, um, but they do still exist in many products. For example, body scrubs, because um, the microbeads work as like an exfoliant. In makeups, you might find microbeads in even some sunscreen. So they do, still do exist um, in some of these products. And then of course our clothing. So when we wash our clothing, um, microfibers are shed from them in the washing machine. And then if you're attached to the city water supply, they go down the drain, end up at the wastewater treatment facility. And while the wastewater treatment facilities um, are engineered to really clean our water for us, right? And they can be very effective up in the 90th percentile of filtering out microfibers. When you're dealing with the numbers of microfibers that are shed from washing our clothes, there's still a percent that then can escape wastewater treatment facilities and end up directly entering in our waterways. So a number of different studies have looked at trying to estimate how many microfibers we're talking about. And if you all look at your sleeve, so um, I think folks in Portland, it's snowing or that area or raining, you're probably wearing a long sleeve shirt. Go ahead and just kind of look at the fibers on your shirt. If you're wearing a, a fleece, that's most likely polyester. If you're wearing a sweatshirt that's not fleece, it could be a blend like cotton, um, polyester, and nylon, for example. So there's a lot of different types of fabric that then shed um, while you're washing them. And depending on the different weave of that fabric, some fabrics might shed more fibers than others. And this is a great um, kind of span of images that were taken by uh, my colleague, Rachel Miller with a resilient project for a clean ocean, where she took these images, close up Im images of different types of fiber. So on the left, uh, the yellow, uh, you can see is acrylic. Uh, in the middle, we have polyester. You know, the third one over is your typical polyester fleece. We have neoprene for the surfers in the group. That's your wetsuit. So you can see that different weaves um, have different patterns and are more or less vulnerable to shedding in the wash. So as I mentioned, a number of different scientific studies have looked at this to try to estimate how many fibers are shed from one garment. And one such figure is that there are 700,000 pieces of microfibers that are shed when you wash your clothes. Now, of course, this varies based on the temperature of your water, the type of detergent you use, the type of washing machine you have. So scientists have really been trying to pick apart the puzzle um, in that area um, to get down to the bottom of the source for microfibers in the environment. A second source that you might not think about as much are just industrial spills. And so, if you have a 3D printer, for example, you might be very familiar with buying these plastic pellets, right? And a lot of our plastic products before they're actually turned into our desirable product are shipped around in these bags of tiny beads. And then we can pour these beads into a mold and make our product out of that. Now, sometimes spills happen, right? And these plastic um, pellets can re be released into the environment uh, that way. Another such source is simply runoff, right? So after a rain event, like you might be seeing this right now in Portland where it's raining, right? If there's litter on the pavement, it's going to get washed down the stormwater drain. And not all of these then end up a wastewater treatment facility. Um, so you can see a lot of fragments will run off the water that way. And um, little fragments of tire and tire dust that many of you may have heard of um, in relation to the issue with coho salmon. Um, and then also we see runoff issues from our agricultural fields. So back to the wastewater treatment facility where we're settling out our waste, a lot of that waste kind of settles down to the bottom and the settlement ponds in the form of what we call biosolids or wastewater sludge. And we do apply wastewater treatment sludge to our agricultural crops. It's a great way to fertilize our soil and to recycle our own waste. However, the problem lurking in that sludge are the microplastics. And so studies are going on right now trying to calculate and figure out to what extent runoff from agricultural fields is then a source directly into our waterways. Kind of related to that, 
is our mismanaged waste. So in our country, um, not like uh, third world countries where we're talking more exposed landfills, but primarily in our country, looking at litter as being mismanaged waste. And I'm sure you all have seen it. I hope that many of you have participated in local community cleanups, but right, if you see that flip-flop or Frisbee or Gatorade bottle on the sidewalk and it doesn't get picked up, that's going to degrade over time time and that's also enhanced by UV light and mechanical action. Uh, for example, in fresh waters where they freeze during the winter, you've got ice, the breaking up of the ice, the forming of the ice, and that can also um, expedite how these um, pieces of litter break into these tiny microplastic particles. So I've been talking at you for a little while, so now we're going to play a little guessing game. And um, I want you to look at this one liter plastic bottle. And based on the surface area of that, imagine that in your mind, I want you to guess how many microplastics you think would form if this bottle were never cleaned up in a cleanup um, event. And you can go ahead and write your guesses in the chat. Lower. These are great guesses. The answer is, oh, my screen, there we go, 39,000. Now, this number is most likely an underestimate because, right, it's based on plastic particles that are one millimeter in size. Now, of course, right, these microplastics are much smaller than that. In fact, um, the majority of what I found are in the range of 100 microns to 300 microns. And 100 microns is one tenth of a millimeter, just to give you kind of size perspective. So let's play the game again, but this time let's look at a plastic bag and think about how many micro um, plastic films could form if this bag never got cleaned up. And don't worry, you're not going to win a jar of microplastics like you would win a jar of jelly beans. But the answer for a plastic bag then is 426,000 pieces, again, based on one millimeters. But it's a fun way to think about the impact that just mismanaged litter can have on the environment and how it is a source of microplastics in these waterways. And finally, um, a source that we are starting to learn more about is simply through atmospheric deposition. And so a study by Dr. Janice Brainy from Utah looked at different types of deposition, both wet and dry in fairly remote areas and is really surprised to, to discover that she was finding fairly high numbers of microplastics that fall to the ground from the atmosphere. And in some cases from hundreds of miles away. And so we call this form of microplastic pollution city dust. And you can kind of imagine it. And if it were a sunny day where you are and you could see a beam of sunlight coming in through the window, sometimes if you look closely, you see dust. And in that dust could be lots of microplastic particles. And depending on the type of microplastic, they can travel very long distances around the globe before they then deposit into the environment. And one um, source of that is just us walking around and are we shedding fibers from our clothing, not just when we wash them, but also when we wear them. And that leads me to really an underestimated source of microfibers. Oops, and here's an example actually of city, of city dust, really. This is a surface snow sample that a student of mine collected in the town of Jackson, where I'm located in Wyoming. And you can see the number of fibers that were in just this one square foot surface area of snow. And that's what I'm talking about when we talk about city dust and microplastics being introduced to the environment that way. So back to that kind of undetected source of microfibers are our clothes dryer, dryers. So we know quite a bit about washing machines and to the point where we use that knowledge to develop solutions like um, the Coraball and uh, aftermarket filters you can put on your washing machine. But up until really last year, clothes dryers were left out of the equation. And so my colleague, Rachel Miller and I um, addressed this question by um, 
drying these hot pink fleece blankets, 100% polyester, in two very different locations in Vermont and Idaho, and two different dryers. We use snow as a media to collect the fibers that then were emitted via our dryer exhaust. So down here on the lower right, it's actually my dryer vent um, and how it directly is releasing microfibers into the surrounding air. So we wondered, first of all, are dryers a source of microfibers into the environment? And then we also wondered, if so, how far out from the dryer vent are we seeing them? And so, um, here's an example of the two different plots on the left and the right. And of course, I needed to rope mine off because I do live in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and I had some visitors that might want to trample through that uh, like elk um, in the middle of the afternoon. So we had our, our two plots um, and we dried that fleece blanket after a fresh snowfall. So we had really kind of a clean slate, if you will. And we used hot pink fibers to do because they were easy for us to differentiate between other fibers. Of course, we did do this in the snow, but then we were able to overlay our results onto a drone shot of the Vermont location. And you can see all the circles there indicate the presence of microfibers. At five feet, 10 feet, 15 feet, you can see the dryer vent is circled in red. And then we did an arc of 30 feet from that as well. And you can see we found microfibers in every single snow sample after drying our hot pink fleece blankets. And to get a better look at the results, down here on the bottom of your screen, you see the, the kind of the grid pattern. Site one is the Idaho site, site two is the Vermont site. And this puts a number to how many fibers we are actually finding. And at some, in some cases, there were just too many fibers to count up in the thousands. And you can see that as you would expect, most of the fibers were turning up in the closest distance to the vent at five feet, but we did see fibers again in all of those. We also noticed that when we had a persistent wind direction and wind speed that altered the pattern of where those fibers were ending up, suggesting that these fibers right, can act as a sail with the wind and travel much further distances. And I will note here that we did not test further than 30 feet. So we don't know how far they actually can travel, but we do know and, and can show based on this data that dryers need to be brought to the table as washing machines have. And we need to start looking at dryer design um, as a source of microfiber pollution, but also how we can alter our dryer design to reduce the amount of microfibers being released into the environment. The upper left here is just um, another part of the study where we put nylon bags, you can see down in the lower right here, onto our dryer vent so that we can actually collect everything that came out of the exhaust, not just at those select locations on the snow. And so that's what this is showing up on the upper right. Um, the, uh, Petri dishes on the left is the first dry, and we dried this blanket three different times. So you can also see, which is interesting, a reduction in the amount of fibers that were released over time. It'd be interesting to do this for even more cycles to see if the amount eventually leveled out or if it continued to decrease. And some of the washing machine studies have looked at things like that as well. And to give you an idea for the amount of lint that we were collecting coming out of the vent, if you hold three fingers up, that's about the width of those filter papers. So that gives you a, a good idea of the amount we're talking about. And it's important to note that both these dryers did have lint traps attached. So the lint traps are not as effective perhaps as we always thought at capturing the lint before it's um, released into the environment. So now that we know what microplastics are and where they come from, what's the big deal, right? What is happening to the environment and the organisms that are then are exposed to these microplastics in our freshwater systems? So to date, at least 220 different species have ingested microplastics. So to give you an idea of the variability of these species across different trophic levels, we have carp, bass, albatross, shrimp, the iconic sea turtle, oysters, chickens, mayflies, and my favorite, the caddis fly. 
So that's just a small example of the number of species that have ingested microplastics. And just ingesting microplastics does not suggest that there's a negative impact. So there's a host of um, toxicological studies that are looking at what happens to an organism after it does ingest microplastics. And so, you know, of course, we think about microplastic and uh, zooplankton down here on the lower right that ingests that plastic, and then the forage species that might ingest the zooplankton, and then the predator that ingests that forage fish, and you know what's happening in the food chain, but what's important here is that we need to understand that plastic is not plastic only, okay? When plastics are being produced, there's a whole host of additives that are put into them. For example, fire retardants, um, UV uh, chemicals to help uh, the plastic withstand UV um, light, phthalates that make plastic more flexible, all sorts of chemicals that make plastic so desirable, right? And the reason why plastic is so heavily used. So we have all these additives um, that when separated out, for example, BPA, we do know can cause some negative harm. But in addition to that, when you have a body of water and you have pollutants that are already in the water, for example, legacy pollutants, pollutants that last in the environment for a long time, like DDT, or you have heavy metals um, and other pesticides, we find that there's an interaction between the plastic and the pollutants that are already in the water, and they do what we call adsorb to that plastic. So then when an animal ingests one particle of plastic, they're getting the plastic, they're also getting all the additives that are in that plastic, and then any pollutants that were already in the water supply. So it's really difficult to tease out what the potential impacts are when you're talking about so many different variable factors. And that's why there's a question mark next to what are the potential impacts to organisms that ingest microplastics. And to kind of give you an idea of some of the laboratory studies that have been conducted on this and to show you what type of impacts we're talking about, I'm gonna show you a graph because I am a scientist and we like numbers and we like graphs. And this graph is actually really great. It's based on a review of the literature on toxicological studies on organisms that are exposed to different types of plastic. And so I'm gonna help you kind of tease apart this graph. So at the top, you see a lot of different numbers. So 14, nine, five, 10. Those are all the different studies that have investigated that type of plastic on a certain organism. So the type of plastic then is on the bottom. You see all the abbreviations. You got polyethylene, polystyrene, PVC, for example. And then underneath you have the organisms or the type of organism. And I embellished it a little bit by putting some cartoon pictorials just because it makes it a little bit easier to read. Um, when you see the image of the crab, you think crustacean, for example. So then the colors indicate what are those impacts. So for example, the number one that you think about is lethal, right? Lethal, lethality and mortality. And you can see that, wow, when you look at fish, fish that were exposed to polyethylene, less than 10% of them actually resulted in death. But when you move over to look at crustacea across many different types of plastics, you see that rate go up. So there's variability in that. Another color we'll look at are the behavioral effects. So this might mean um, increased lethargy, okay? Um, less movement, reduced predator response, reduced feeding time, for example. And you can see this, the um, studies that showed some behavioral effects um, widened a little bit. We see them in fish, we see them in crustacea, mollusks, and annelids. And finally, physical effects. Okay, so this could be stunted growth, for example. It could be reduced fat reserves, okay, and you see that as well. So the question is, why is there so much variability in these studies, right? And why is the question not black and white, right? And really what it is, is that microplastic is not microplastic is not microplastic, okay? So on the left here is another um, figure that's really great because it's a review of the literature. 
of studies, toxicology studies that have looked at this. So you can see kind of the effects listed on the left, behavioral effects, um, gene expression. And then we also get into ecosystem level stuff, community function and community structure. And then the colors, if you look on the left, the pink or the red, those are the studies that actually with each effect show no reported impacts. And then on the right are studies that show that there were effects, negative effects, okay, reported effects. So it's almost 50-50, look how they're mirrored, okay? And this further complicates this question, you know, what are the potential impacts? Well, it depends. And what it depends on is displayed over here on the right, where it could depend on the particle size, how big that particle was when they were exposed to those organisms, or the concentration, okay? A lot of the lab studies to date have used um, microplastics in concentrations much, much higher than what we find in the environment, which really kind of argues why it's so important to understand to what extent microplastics are in or found in different environments and at what concentrations. Then we have the different types of plastics. Some plastics have more additives in them than others, like PVC, for example, is a plastic that has a lot of different additives that make it PVC versus some of the other plastics out there. Um, the condition of the particle, how old it is, what shape it is, is it a fiber, a fragment? And then the organism, what species, what sex, what state of development, were they larvae or adult? So you can start to understand the complexity involved in this. But we also then start to think about ecosystem level impacts, right? So all those toxicological studies are based on single organisms. So how does this play out in the ecosystem? What are those ecosystem level impacts? And the research is really starting to look at that now. But some examples of potential impacts are the fact that microplastics act as vectors. So this picture here on the right um, was, is a piece of microplastic that I found on one of the Oregon beaches and attached to it was a happy little mollusk. And so if that organism had attached to a fragment way up river and then used that river and that plastic fragment as a way to transport itself downstream and then colonize a new environment, that is a pretty uh, significant risk that needs to be explored especially when we start talking about bacteria and bacteria that colonize these microplastics in the environment. The science is kind of just getting started in the terrestrial environments and look at the, at the impacts primarily of microplastics in soil. So for example, what are the physiochemical properties when microplastics are present? And so factors such as do microplastics alter pH of soil? Do they alter water retention or water repellency, for example? And whenever you start to alter your soil, you start to alter your ecosystem level services. So that's something that's really, really important that really needs to be investigated uh, thoroughly. And then as we're still talking about soil, microplastics could impact the microbiota in the soil and like the mycorrhizae and the relationships between plant roots and the microbiome. And when we start altering that, we alter the nutrient cycling of that ecosystem. And then finally, right, microplastics, if they're an environmental stressor, how does that play out when you have cumulative or additive stressors? So we see ocean acidification, we see increasing temperatures, and then we also have microplastics how do those all play out together? And of course, how does this all play out in the environment? And there are some new um, studies that are underway right now looking at this, for example, in the Experimental Lakes region up in Canada, led in part by Dr. Chelsea Rockman from the University of Toronto that is um, starting to look at these ecosystem level impacts. And I'm really excited to follow these studies and see how all of this plays out kind of in a, in a real life ecosystem situation. So that said, we now know what microplastics are. We know where they come from. We know that there are potential impacts to our organisms, even though we don't know to what extent. So the question is, and what you're, you're all probably excited to find out, right? Are, are there microplastics in the Columbia River and what is going on with our local waterways? 
So we set out to answer this very question in 2016, actually, when we began our study. And our question was, are there microplastics in the Snake and Columbia rivers? And at the time, there was only a handful of studies looking at freshwater systems in the lower 48. And so the first question was, well, are we going to find them at all, right? So much of what we know were in marine systems. Are microplastics also in the freshwater systems? And when you look at rivers specifically, how do those microplastics behave in the river? How are they transported? And will the numbers of microplastics increase as we move from upriver to downriver? And will we see an increase in microplastics when we move through rural, rural areas and protected areas to areas of high human population density? And then finally, when we look at these samples collected in the same way, using the same methods at the same time, are there hot spots? Are there notable hot spots or areas that happen to have higher numbers of microplastics than others? And so we collected water samples every 50 river miles. We started up in Yellowstone and then traveled through Grand Teton National Park, all the way through the state of Idaho, up along the Oregon-Idaho border into Washington and out along the Columbia. Um, and down below, you can see some pictures of some of the sites just on the Columbia. So we had a total of seven sample sites on the Columbia River. And you can see some of them are fairly remote, although they do follow the I-84 corridor. Um, some of them are in areas where there's not high human population density. And then of course, towards the Portland area, Cascade Locks area, that increased. So at each site, we collected two different types of samples. Um, on the upper left there, you see my research assistant, Ellen Neatman, collecting a sample using a plankton net of a mesh size of 100 microns. So that means that we were only able to look for microplastics that were larger than 100 microns. And then we also collected a grab sample um, approximately two liters. It was a two liter mason jar. Um, the average was 1.8 liters that was collected at the end of a long pole to keep it as far away from our bodies as we possibly could. Now, as you can imagine, when we're filtering out water on site, we end up with a lot of organic material, biological matter. And so finding microplastics in environmental samples is like looking for a needle in the haystack. And you have to remove the hay in order to find the needle. And so when we take our samples back to the lab, we process them. For example, we use a digest, a hydrogen peroxide with a catalyst digest to help us break down some of that organic material. And then we try to float the plastics out. So if you've been in the Salt Lake area in Utah, and if you've ever gone swimming in the Salt Lake, it's fairly buoyant, right? It doesn't require as much effort to stay afloat. Same thing with microplastics. We add them to a super saturated salt solution. So we use basically your table salt, sodium chloride, and then also a heavier salt, sodium iodide, to try to float out as many different plastics with different weights as we could. And then once we've eliminated that stuff, it be, makes looking for that needle in the haystack much, much easier. So then we can use various criteria to identify potential plastics using a microscope. And then go the next step um, using an analytical technique called Raman or FTIR, two different types of techniques that you can use that then identify the exact type of polymer you're looking at. For example, is it nylon or polyester? So yes, we found microplastics. We found plastics in 75% of the grab samples and 93% of the net samples. So the net samples, right, collect a much larger volume of each sample than the grab samples do. And then all of the net samples that we collected on the Columbia River contained microplastics and six out of the seven grab samples. And you can see some examples of what we found um, with the size uh, micrometer there for you at 100 microns. We found films, we found fragments, we found beads, and of course we found fibers. And to get a little bit more detailed on the upper right, we did find a correlation with the number of microplastics found uh, as we moved from the headwaters all the way out to the Columbia. And this pattern held true in just the Snake River and when we added the Columbia River samples as well. 
On the upper left, you can see a whole bunch of colors. And the orange indicates fibers. And the blue arrow down here points at site 20. So if you look only at the right side of that graph, those are the Columbia River samples. And it's very exciting. I've seen in the news that a new report was released by Environment Oregon, and they collected 30 different environmental samples throughout the state, and they found plastics in all of their samples as well, particularly fibers. So it is now well known that most environmental samples collected throughout the world, the most common type of plastic we find are the microfibers. So um, it's interesting to see a lot of comparabilities between these two different studies. And then down below is our kind of concentration map. So this is just for the net samples. The units are reported as microplastics per 1,000 liters. And so the larger the dot and the deeper the circle, the more microplastics we found. So you can kind of see there are five notable circles that stand out on the map, one of which is a sample in the Columbia River. So let's look more closely at some of those. It's interesting that our hotspots existed, at least in the um, Idaho or the Snake River samples, in areas where there was very little human population. So for, for example, in the upper left, we have Brownlee Reservoir. That is downriver from the city of Weezer, um, Idaho, and Boise area, and also from the Magic Valley. So on the right, that map there, the top red circle on that map is the Brownlee Reservoir. And you can see that nice, rich, green agricultural zone upriver from that. So one potential explanation for why we found the highest number of microplastics in this reservoir could potentially be the fact that it is downstream from heavy use agriculture where there is some biosolids application. Now that is just a hypothesis that has not been um, fully tested and experimented on. However, um, we are seeing more and more scientists look at agriculture and biosolid application as being a potential source for microplastics. And then um, it kind of falls true with our second hotspot down in the bottom left of the screen in Adrian, Oregon, also directly downstream from a lot of agricultural use where fields, some of these fields were um, receiving biosolids and some of them, there's very little riparian corridor. And so the question right, still stands is, um, is agricultural source? And, and is that why we happen to see more microfibers in this sample than at others? And then finally, to bring it closer to home, um, we had three sites actually that um, had heavy recreational use and we found high numbers of microplastics at those sites. So this is in the Cascade Locks area on the Columbia um, at the Yacht Club where on that particular day, there happened to be a ricotta going on. So it's an interesting thing to think about um, is this impact of just simply being outside and recreating as we introduce microplastics into the environment. So how does that stand up? All this stuff, but what's the significance of that? Well, on average, the sites on the Columbia River um, showed an average of three microplastics per thousand liters, which is not significantly different from what we found in just our Snake River samples at 2.39, but it is higher than what a similar study showed in the Ottawa River of Canada lower than a study in the tributaries of the Great Lakes. They were finding on average four microplastics per thousand liters. And finally, it's interesting to think about the fact that it's comparable, right? These numbers are not outrageous. They're very complementary to what we're finding in other rivers and waterways, uh, freshwater rivers in the US. And so in a study that was going on at the exact same time on the Hudson River in New York, they looked at all anthropogenic fibers. So that includes cotton, cellulose, and plastic. And they found one fiber per liter. Whereas on the Columbia, we are averaging about one microfiber per liter. And that includes all, um, or sorry, that includes just the synthetic fibers. So there's some variability there, but still comparable. If we look more internationally, down here, we've got the Snake and Lower uh, Columbia Rivers down at the very bottom of this table. 
and then some other rivers around the world. And again, the numbers fairly compa comparable. Um, however, I want to draw your attention to the sampling method. So we use a 100 micron mesh net and 50% of the particles we found in our net samples were between 100 and 300 microns. So compare that to the studies above, especially those using about 300 micron mesh sizes. Had they used a smaller mesh size, those numbers most likely would have increased. Or had we used a larger mesh size, our numbers most likely would have decreased. So it's really important to pay attention to that. And to make note of one of the challenges in studying microplastics in the environment is that there's no standard protocol, right? And scientists are really trying to come to a consensus on the best sampling methodology out there so that we can easily compare our results with other studies and other waterways. So to summarize, Microplastics are ubiquitous in the environment and the Columbia River is no exception. We do know that there are negative effects associated with organisms exposed to microplastics. We do know where these microplastics come from. We can identify sources, activities, behaviors. And plastic is not going away. It is far too valuable of a product. Um, and so there are ways that we can curb our use, reduce our use of when we don't necessarily need plastic. There's ways or, or things that, um, right, we need plastic. For example, the pandemic right now has showed us that plastic is really important in the hospital setting, but it's not so important to eat your meal with a plastic fork, right? There are still a lot of knowledge gaps, but those gaps are not necessarily hindering solutions to the problem. There are some amazing solutions out there and different types of solutions that all can be applied together to help reduce this potential problem in the environment. And so I have an image here of a bathtub overflowing. Right. If you put the plug in your tub and you turn on the tap and you leave the room and forget about it, when you come back, the first thing you're going to do is probably going to be to turn off the tap, right, to stop the water from entering the tub. It's not going to be grab a bucket and bail it out. Okay. So we need to think about solutions that do both. Think about solutions on the downstream end, like cleaning up the litter that we do find, and also focus on solutions upstream that really um, address how we can reduce the amount of plastics from entering the environment to begin with. So I challenge you to be the change. Um, there are a lot of solutions, for example, focus on the fast fashion um, movement. There are clothing companies that are trying to determine or figure out ways to make their clothing shed less. There are engineers on board trying to develop products to help um, stop the microfibers from entering the environment to begin with. There are politicians um, trying to work on various acts to help reduce the overall use, for example, bag bans, um, single-use plastic bans. And then there are also just individuals like us that can make a change. So you can rethink your choices or rethink the way something happens. So for example, in the upper left, sure, you can stir your coffee with a plastic stirrer, but you can also just use a piece of pasta to stir your coffee. I find that to be a really creative and relatively affordable way to replace a single use plastic with something else. You can buy or win a coral ball, for example. So my colleague, Rachel Miller, used her knowledge and her scientific research to design this coral ball, designed after coral, to try to filter out fibers that are in the washing machine. And independent lab studies have determined that it can be anywhere from 20 to 30% effective at removing fibers from the wash, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it's something, right? Um, and it's fantastic if you're a renter or you don't have a washing machine, you go to a laundromat, you can bring your core ball with you, put it in the wash and reduce the amount of fibers released from your laundry. If you do own your home, 
Um, you can think about whether you want to install an aftermarket filter on your washing machine, um, as long as you're willing to right, inspect that enough and remind yourself that you need to clean off the filter. Lab studies have shown that these aftermarket filters can be anywhere from 90% effective at removing um, fibers from your washing machine. And if you use the filter and the core ball together, that's even a better increase in the amount of fibers you can remove. And then of course, because we're nearing on the holidays and we're giving each other a lot of gifts, you can stop using wrapping paper that has a plastic coating on it and cannot be recycled. You can wrap your presents in fun, beautiful fabrics and then reuse that fabric wrapping. So there's a lot of different solutions out there. And I wanna do one more activity in the chat and I'd love to hear some of your thoughts or solutions or things that you do that you think other people would benefit from. So let's just take a minute to think and share some of those solutions. Yeah, there's a comment here about looking at um, diff different jurisdictional levels, locations, national, subnational, international governments, absolutely for developing solutions. He has dryer clothes in the drying rack. That's, that's my favorite go-to, although I live in Idaho where the air is very dry. Lots of great solutions. And so I want to close by bringing it back home to where we started. If we all could make one simple change to reduce the amount of microplastics we personally contribute to the environment, we can then revisit each of these locations and not see microplastics, not because we can't see them, but because they're not actually there. So thank you all for attending this webinar and sitting through and listening to me. And I have some people to thank as well. I could not do any of my work without my major funder, the Wyoming Inbury Network. And then in addition to that, uh, a number of my colleagues and students that I've worked with over the year, including my current student, Ann Dalton, up kind of front and center, way up on the Dinwiddie Cirque of the Wind River Range, where she's currently analyzing snow samples for the presence of microplastics. So that's all that I have to say at this point. I'd really love to open it up to questions, if any of you have any. Thank you so much, Kirsten. And just a reminder, people can put their questions in the chat. And we have had some coming in during the talk, so thanks, everybody. Um, to get started, uh, one of the questions that came in was, are the microplastics that are in cosmetics and lotions listed on the ingredients? And is there a way to find out which products contain them? Yes, um, it's been a while since I visited this app. So actually I'm embarrassed. I don't know if it still works, but there's an app called Beat the Bead. Um, I can write that in the, in the chat. Um, and it's a place where they host um, or they, they list a number of the products that do contain microbeads in them. They used to be able to, you could scan the barcode with your phone and see if there are microbeads in that product. And primarily you wanna look for polyethylene uh, as the sole content. Now there was the Microbead Free Waters Act um, in 2015. So a number of different um, uh, companies have been reducing and eliminating the amount of microbeads in their products, but that pertains specifically to products that you can wash off. So products that you can leave on, like I think makeup is included as one you leave on, is exempt from that. That's a great question. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, I can't keep I up with the chat. These are great comments coming in. I'm getting distracted. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of great comments and questions. So people feel free to take a look at the chat. Uh, somebody asked about the your study of hotspots on the Columbian State River, wondering if the hotspots correlate to areas where the water is slowed, for instance, upstream of a dam. That is a fantastic question. We did look at that. So we did find a positive correlation with lower flow and higher microplastics. Um, 
And there's other research that have found very similar patterns, particularly in reservoirs of China. Um, and so do reservoirs serve as a sink for microplastic pollution? Yes, that is absolutely something that needs to be investigated more. Um, at the same time, the longer microplastics are in an area, the more time for them to become biofouled, and then they can settle out into the sediment. So at the time that this study was conducted, um, really the most acceptable method was to look at surface water because right, we all thought microplastics floated. And of course, that's something that I guess carried over from the marine studies. But now it's really important to look at the whole water column, the sediment as well, um, to get a better idea of where those microplastics are. But yes, indeed, um, reservoirs have been considered to be a sink for microplastics. And that was something that we thought about kind of going into the study, were we gonna see them spike and then drop as we sample downstream of the reservoir and then spike again. Um, but the number of samples that we had for this study, even though there's quite a few throughout the whole length of the river, um, it would be interesting to do much more intensive sampling um, above a reservoir, in the reservoir and downriver of the reservoir. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, on the Columbia River, one of our biggest issues is temperature. And I was curious if you know anything about the relationship between microplastics and temperature, or if any research is happening on that. Um, there is. There's, there are scientists now that are looking at in the lab and adjusting these environmental conditions with microplastics, but unfortunately that's the extent of what I know. I can't direct you to particular research labs or scientists that are involved with that work, but it's very important work. And yes, people are starting to look at that as part of kind of the whole push to understand more of the whole ecosystem level processes and those cumulative effects of other environmental stressors. I think we've got time for a few more. Okay. Eric asked, what efforts have been made to quantify the amount of microplastics crossing out of the mouths of our rivers into the oceans? How much plastic enters our ocean as microplastic? That's a fantastic question. And um, you've caught me. I, I, there are figures and there are numbers and there are studies that have been done on major rivers, not the Columbia to date for how they have estimated that. Um, but there are scientists out there that have done that, and I cannot provide for you a figure off the top of my head of the number of microplastics. However, as we learn more, we do know that terrestrial environments and rivers are the major contributors to ocean plastics. And someone asked, should we avoid buying fleece that's made from recycled plastics, which are often sold to eco-minded consumers as being an environmentally friendly choice? That is a really good question um, and a difficult one to answer. Um, realistically, um, fleece is a good product. Um, I think that there are ways we can curb the amount of microfibers that enter the environment. Um, I do not know of any studies that are looking at fleece that is just fleece versus fleece that is made from recycled fleece to look at does recycled fleece have a higher shed rate than um, clothing made from non-recycled fleece? Um, so I do not have data for that for you. Um, but I think one thing that you can do, an action you can take is, you know, first of all, I don't want anybody to go throw out all of their fleece. Um, that would not be a solution to the problem. However, washing your clothes less, washing them on cold cycles, um, air drying them, uh, are probably other ways you can reduce um, the amount of fleece entering the environment from your, your sweatshirt. However, right, making fleece from a virgin fleece versus recycled is definitely better uh, if you're going to go one way or the other. Thanks. And we'll do one more and then we'll announce our winner. Okay. Um, Adam asked, are there ways of improving microplastic removal rates from wastewater treatment plants? There is, however, it's a really difficult thing to do because it would involve a huge overhaul 
of the wastewater treatment facility system. Um, and then to filter water at that type of level, you know, whether or not we can actually do that. A lot of research is looking at bacteria species that have been known to um, degrade those microplastics, but you know, how realistic is it to overhaul all of our wastewater treatment systems to incorporate this new type of technology at the point we're at now? No, um, I think that would be a bit of a task, but it is important. That's definitely a solution that needs to be investigated, engineered, right? And perhaps when that wastewater treatment facility is planned or needed to be redesigned, that is definitely brought to the table. Great, well, thank you so much. I think um, we got to a lot of the questions. There's still more coming in, but um, I really appreciate everyone's feedback. And I think that it's just evidence of, you know, this is an, going to be an ongoing conversation. And, um, you know, the more we learn, learn about this topic, I think the more people want to get involved and, you know, figure out what we can do about it. Um, so I would love to announce our winner of the Cora Ball. Um, I did a random number generator of everybody who signed up and Trina Sherwood is our winner. So congratulations, Trina, I'll be sending you a Cora Ball microfiber laundry catching ball. Um, and I just also wanted to let everybody else know that um, as a follow-up to this webinar, we will be sending you an email that will include a recording of the webinar. So if you know someone else who wasn't able to, to attend today or someone who you think might be interested in this, please feel free to share that. Um, you know, we would love for, for this to, to get around. Um, and I just want to say again, thank you so much to um, Kirsten for joining us today and for taking the time to speak to us. Um, it was really wonderful and super informative. Thank you and thanks everybody for attending and taking the time out of your day to, to listen and to learn. And I apologize, there are so many chats coming in and wonderful comments and thoughts and questions. I, I appreciate all of that and I really apologize if we couldn't answer your question here on the live webinar. Thank you.